first Humanities Forum event of 2014 to 2015. I'm really pleased to see so many of you here. We have a really exciting fall schedule of events, um, many of which are focused on the important role of the humanities in building uh, civic engagement. Um, so take a look at our flyer, which should be available, or take a look at the Dresser Center website, dressercenter.uobc.edu for the upcoming events. I'm not going to say much about Mark Tribe. We've all come to listen to. I think Kathy Marmer is going to do that in a minute. Um, but I do want to say we're really delighted to have him as part of the forum. This talk is also part of the Dresher Center's Digital Humanities Initiative, which promotes interdisciplinary collaborations, projects, and courses with a digital humanities focus. Later in the semester, on December 2nd, the Digital Humanities Initiative will welcome Ann Rubin and Kelly Bell, professors at UMBC, to speak about their project of digitizing Sherman's March to the Sea. So I hope you'll think about attending that one. I also invite you to attend the next Humanities Forum event, which is coming up this Tuesday, September 23rd, 7 p.m. in the University Ballroom. Please join us to welcome Sonia Nazario, the author of Enrique's Journey, which is the new student book experience selection for the year, and just a really terrific book. And uh, we look forward to that event, too. So without further ado, Kathy. Thank you so much. Hello. Hi, welcome. I'm so glad to see so many people turning out for tonight's event. And I get a wonderful opportunity to welcome our tribe to you on this day. I'm very, very happy that we're able to make it today. And again, to everybody who's here today. So I just need to, of course, thank the following people who made the event possible and also who made Mark's lecture as well as the graduate student studio visits possible. And that's the Dresher Center. Um, and Jessica Kern, thank you very much. And of course, I'd like to also thank Natalia, who is the administrative assistant. She did a lot of work as the <laughs> liaison between Mark, the visual arts uh, department, as well as the Dresher Center. And I'd like to thank uh, Circa, and specifically its director, Tim Noe. Uh, Tim actually gave me the invitation. Uh, they, he was the person who um, allowed me to meet so I was really pleased with that. And then I would um, also like, of course, to thank very much the visual arts department. Um, I have just a quick reminder, I just hold that to remind you that uh, the next visiting artist lecture will be by the artist in residence, um, and her name is Mia Pomsik, and she'll be here on Wednesday, October the 15th, and she's here for, um, I think, a couple, uh, about a month's stay, so I'm really looking forward to hearing her talk. So a little bit about Mark, to sort of uh, situate you. Mark's work explores the intersection of media technology and politics, his photographs, <laughs> installations, and videos, um, and performances have been exhibited widely. His commissioned project, which is now um, up at the Corcoran Gallery of Art at Washington, D.C., is called Plain Air, and it actually closes in September the 28th. So if you haven't had a chance yet to see it, I really highly recommend that you make uh, a trip to Washington and have a look. Um, he's also the author of two books and numerous articles, and uh, in particular, uh, his new book is, uh, his book, New Media, is really a must read. Uh, and what it is, is it uh, introduces new media as an art movement and addresses its contents and its strategies. <coughs> so Mark is now currently uh, the chair of the MFA uh, Fine Arts Department at the School of Visual Arts uh, in New York City. Um, and in 1996, and this is where I sort of really um, knew Mark the most, was through this work the, of the Rhizome. And Rhizome is an organization, an online database that supports and collects the work of new media artists. Um, I've also been asked to please side on your So without any more of it, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Natalia, and everyone else who helped organize this and invited me here. 
and thanks for coming tonight. I'm just curious um, to know how many of us or of you are undergraduates, mostly, and any graduate students? Just a few? OK, great. And then some faculty, too? Yeah? OK, just to get a sense of who I'm speaking with. I've been an undergraduate. I've been a graduate student. I've been faculty. Um, I'm going to, when I speak at colleges and universities and art schools, I like to begin where the youngest members of the audience are. So this is work that I made in college, uh, in my last year of college. Just to you know, give you just, a, I'm not even going to talk about it, but I was making paintings. I was also making videos. I did some experiments with sound, like making sound loops. Remember those little cassettes that were in answering machines that had like 30 seconds? So I was using those, recording voices on them and stuff like that. Um, experimented with photography and silk screen and um, I never did any sculpture, but tried my hand at a whole bunch of other stuff. Learned to draw. And I, um, after, uh, after college, took a year off and then found myself in graduate school at the University of California, San Diego, um, where I was influenced by one of the faculty there, Alan Capro, who you may have heard of. He's closely associated with happenings. So back in the, like, late 1950s and early 1960s, people started to talk about all kinds of things as happenings. Oh, you should come to this picnic. It's going to be kind of like a happening. Um, but, but he was using it in a rather specific way to refer to a kind of participatory art practice that blurred the boundaries between art and everyday life. And this is one of his best known pieces called Fluids. As you can see, uh, people are carrying blocks of ice and assembling a structure out of ice that will eventually melt. It was ephemeral. It was really about the process of making it as much as it was about creating something uh, physical in space. It was a sculpture, but it was also an activity, and it was a social process. This was, it, um, Capro himself was uh, influenced by and in dialogue with John Cage, the musician, uh, who is famous for his piece 433, in which um, the audience listened to four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, or rather, in fact, the ambient sounds that were in the room, um, drawing attention to um, aesthetic experience in everyday life and to the conceptual uh, dimensions of social experiences. And this uh, found its way into my own work towards the end of my time in graduate school, in particular with this project that I made in collaboration with a couple of other grad students at UCSD for Insight 94, which was a biennial of site-specific art in San Diego and Tijuana. So artists did site-specific projects on both sides of the border. And I was invited to do a project here. This is Southwestern College, a two-year junior college or community college in Chula Vista, which is right on the border of Mexico, right, you know, right on the border of Tijuana. This, this campus was constructed all at once uh, in the mid-1970s, all these white rectangles or you know, white shapes in the middle are the roofs of the buildings of the campus. As you can see, it's surrounded by parking lots for about 3,500 cars. And so they would fill up in the morning and then empty, then fill up again in the afternoon for the afternoon classes, and then fill up a third time in the evening for the night classes. Um, so about 10,000 people a day would park in these spaces. And uh, as we visited the site, we became interested in these parking lots as a space that really mediated everyone's experience of this institution. And th started thinking, what could we do to draw attention to the aesthetic possibilities of this space? How could we create a kind of social experiment that would you know, wake everybody up to this experience that to us, as people who had gone to you know, uh, campuses that were more residential in nature, um, we found it quite unusual. And this is what we did. We didn't do a sound check. Um, wait, let's see. Did you drop? Yeah. Nope. But let me just try plugging in. Let's try again. This might be really loud. You might have thought you were seeing things. You were. I don't know. Parked according to color in the lots. There. Sorry. Today, more than 3,000 cars. The project is a work of art sponsored by the college's art gallery and organized by three local artists. Drivers were directed to the correct lot by color coordinators as they arrived this morning. The artists did their homework ahead of time, counting cars and tallying colors to figure out how much room to make 
for each color. Okay, you're gonna go to the beach parking lot. It's right up here. In the, yeah, you're gonna go to beach. And it's the D parking lot. It's like three parking lots. Okay, right right. We've actually taken a place that people don't think about spending time, which is a parking lot. Somewhere very boring, somewhere you try to avoid, and turn it into a place which might be somewhere to go and actually take a look at what's there. Separating out the colors involves a lot of cooperation on the part of people, and there we kind of get into things like, you know, it's sort of a social experiment. People have been wonderfully cooperative. Occasionally a red car has popped in and we've been told, don't resist people too much. Persuade them, but if they insist parking a red car in a beige lot, go ahead. to see what it's going to be. Why are you in this lot? <clears throat> because they don't have any purple and the closest thing they can come up with is electric blue. Are you offended? <laughs> Not at all. Like <laughs> no, I like being purple. Hi, hi. What do you think about this? I think it looks pretty good. Hi, what do you think about this? Uh, it's really nice. Hi, what do you guys think about this? It's bullshit. Fine. <laughs> so... Yeah, so you know, going from thinking of art, art making as making objects as a painter, making images, uh, to you know, when I was working with video and sound, still making artifacts, really making discrete things that um, could be stored and then re-experienced, and, and now with with Car Park, making something that's really ephemeral, that's participatory, and that's social. Those became important themes for me. Also, the, I like the idea of an intervention in public space, art that met, would meet you in your everyday life rather than you're having to pass through the doors of an institution uh, with all of its implications and the kind of uh, the, the aura uh, with, that it imbues art with. So around the same time, uh, so Car Park was 1994. I'm going back one year to 1993. Um, Many of you were probably very young at that time. Um, so we started reading about the internet. Um, nobody I knew you know, was using the, the internet, and most people didn't even really know what it was. But like reading like the newspaper, you started to hear this kind of buzz about you know, this, this new technology, this network of networks that was going to change the world, a magazine called Wired started to be published uh, out of San Francisco. And uh, you know, as someone who, I showed that one project, Car Park, but there were several others, other projects that I thought of as, as performative interventions in public space. And I thought, you know, the internet is going to be an interesting place to stage interventions. It's going to be a new kind of public sphere. Um, and I just kind of chased after it. Um, so this, is, this screenshot just shows the first web browser. And I managed to get myself you know, on the internet and to download that browser in 1993. And I just was fascinated. All of a sudden, the internet, which before then had been really a text-based medium primarily, and that you interacted with with a command line interface, so like typing commands, suddenly it was point and click. And it was graphical. And it involved not only text, but also images and sounds and animations and even little postage stamp sized videos. So I thought, this, this can be an art medium. I moved to, to Berlin from San Francisco. Uh, I had applied for a residency and, and didn't get in and just decided to go anyway. And uh, you know, found a studio and a place to live and a day job. Um, I, had, I had made one website in San Diego as a catalog for an art project. Um, so I knew a little HTML, just enough to get me a job as a web designer. And, um, and so I was like working at this web design firm by day and going to a lot of like underground uh, like techno clubs at night, but also um, writing code. And I was invited to do an, a net-based art project for what I think was the first online gallery or online exhibition venue for 
internet-based art. It was called computer-aided curating. It was started by, a, by an artist, Ava Grubinger. Um, and, uh, and this is what I came up with. I, I rode my bicycle around Berlin with an Apple Quick Take. It was the first consumer digital camera and took pictures of construction sites. So 1995 was six years after the Berlin Wall fell. So Berlin used to be divided between uh, West Berlin, which was controlled by West Germany, um, and East Berlin, which was controlled by East Germany, but was really kind of part of the Soviet Union. Um, and, uh, and after the wall came down, um, the whole city went into this massive phase of reconstruction. So everywhere you turned, there was scaffolding or a big hole in the ground. And at the same time, on the internet, everywhere you turned, there were these black and yellow under construction GIFs. Because people were putting up websites, but they weren't finished yet. And so that was the kind of the custom. And I thought, this is interesting. And they were kind of like these two parallel spaces, both under construction, the physical urban space of the city, and then this kind of virtual public space of the internet. And I wanted to, to kind of layer those two maps on top of each other. So I, I scanned in a map of the city and put it on this web page. And, uh, and wherever you clicked, you would see a different little image of a construction site. Quite simple in retrospect, but at the time, this is a, you know, th so there's this whole genre now of internet art or net art, or now some people even are making what they call post-internet art. But um, this is one of the first net art projects, for what it's worth. There were about 100 images of different construction sites. These images are tiny. They're um, uh, 320 pixels wide by 240 pixels high, which is like nothing. If you display it on a retina display, it looks like this big. So I had to blow it up a bit for this presentation. Some of the, you know, some of the photos are pretty descriptive. Others get a little bit more abstract. I really like the um, digital artifacts that this um, first digital camera produced. So this is rebar, the vertical um, steel bars that they, uh, onto which they pour concrete. But because the light was low, um, it created these beautiful kind of DNA-like forms. So first net art project, 1995. Not the first ever, but among the, maybe among the first 100, or maybe 25 even. Um, nobody's really tried to count. So, so I'm living in Berlin, uh, you know, out of grad school. Uh, I was also continuing to do some what, of what we would now call social practice projects, participatory art projects. But I was really excited about the potential of the internet in particular, but new media in general uh, for, for artistic practices. And I went to a couple of uh, electronic art or art and technology festivals. There's one called Ars Electronica in Linz, Austria. If you ever find yourself in Europe around Labor Day, go to Linz. It's pretty cool. Um, people from all over the world converge and exchange information and ideas and show projects. And I also went to one in Rotterdam. Basically, you know, getting in a, in a car with a bunch of friends and driving all night and arriving at this conference and, and discovering that there were people all over the world, young artists, older artists, curators, critics, who were fascinated, like I was, by the potential of these new technologies. But in order to find out what each other were, what, what, what other people were doing, we had to kind of get ourselves there. And not that many people had the time and the money to do that. It's not so easy to get yourself to Linz, Austria um, in early September. Um, so I thought this is really a kind of online community waiting to happen. And that term, online community, was itself very novel. But this idea that a community could be some, a group of people that was defined not by geography, but by a shared interest and connected through a network um, was you know, really compelling to me. So I, I created first an email list for the exchange of information, ideas about new media art, a place to develop a kind of critical discourse about these emerging practices. And then a website that archived the contents of the conversation selectively. So we would take the most interesting posts, tag them with keywords, put them in a database, and then we made them accessible via the web, a very primitive search engine. Called it rhizome. That's a botanical term for a kind of horizontal root that extends underground and then sends up shoots. So it's a kind of horizontally distributed, non-hierarchical network. It's a term that was used by Deleuze and Guattari, the fairly well-known French post-structuralist anti-philosophers. Um, in their book, Thousand Plateaus, or Mille Plateaus, the first chapter is called the rhizome. So they use this botanical term for a horizontal root that extends underground and sends up shoots. They use it as a metaphor, as a trope, for non-hierarchical distributed networks. Um, they have this wonderful quote. They say, we're tired of trees, tired of hierarchies. Right? The idea that you could have a non 
hierarchical, a kind of flat network was, um, was also a nice metaphor for an online community and for a platform that could hopefully level and disintermediate the hierarchies of the art world. You know, being a young artist in Berlin, fresh out of grad school, I really felt kind of like uh, a nobody, to be honest. And uh, you know, curators and critics didn't feel to me like enablers. Um, they felt like gatekeepers, keeping me you know, apart from my potential audience. So I had this idea that this online community could also serve as a way to, um, to, to create a kind of many-to-many, -many grassroots, bottom-up community. So, you know, so it, you know, it would be like more of a meritocracy. Anybody could talk to anybody. Um, I, I, um, I, in trying to explain the idea to people at the time, I described it as Art Forum meets Alta Vista. Alta Vista was a search engine before Google, like the main best search engine. And you know, Art Forum, as many of you know, is an art magazine. So it's got like an editorial board. And then it's got a kind of a stable of writers. And if you're an artist, you hope and pray that Art Forum will write about you, but you're completely powerless to affect that. You know, an, ed you know, an editor has to invite a critic to see your show and review it, or maybe a critic pitches the idea. But I thought, why can't artists just say, hey, I did this thing, and write about each other's shows? And that was kind of the idea. Fairly naive, but somehow uh, it had some traction, and it kind of snowballed. And I suddenly found myself running a nonprofit organization in New York. I started it in Berlin and moved to New York a few months later. And um, it just kind of took off. And I had very little time to make art, although I did sometimes think about Rhizome as a social sculpture, as a kind of participatory, collaborative uh, artwork in which social relations were the medium. And we were doing all kinds of exciting things. In addition to the discussion, which was taking place by email and on the web, we started um, archiving works of new media art because nobody else was preserving them, and they were very ephemeral. So there was this one story, this uh, Dutch artist named Akka Wagenaar um, was teaching at, the, at the, um, the Media Art Academy in Cologne in Germany. And uh, she had made an, one of the very first net art projects that was about Hiroshima put it on a server, and then she went to teach somewhere else. And the systems administrator saw these files that belonged to a former faculty member and deleted them. And there went art history, right, with a click of a mouse. So you know, when that was, because that was happening, we started to tell artists, well, you can give us a copy of your work, and we'll, we'll not only make it accessible so people can find it, it'll become like this, this archive, this resource, um, but also we'll, we'll preserve it. We'll keep it for safekeeping. So now it's got well over 2,000 works, and it's by far the largest archive of its kind, and Rhizome has really um, done a lot to uh, figure out how to preserve these ephemeral works. If you think about it, um, like that work, Traces of a Constructed City, I showed you, um, it broke. Um, I, it, it's finally going to be showed in a museum next year, and I went to check, check on it, and it didn't work anymore because you know, HTML had changed. It had evolved. The technology I used, HTML 1.0, had become obsolete, so I had to rewrite the HTML code so that it would work. Um, so there's all these preservation challenges that, that come along with new media art. We started commissioning artwork, so we would get money from foundations and then uh, give it away to artists to do projects, exhibitions, lots of different kinds of events. So it's now um, grown into a, a small but thriving uh, not-for-profit arts organization. Um, in 2003, I'd been running it for, I guess, seven years. Um, we formed an affiliation with the New Museum of Contemporary Art, which is a museum in New York City. So Rhizome became kind of like an organization in residence there. Um, and, uh, and I was able to step away. So since 2003, I've been on the board of Rhizome, but not working there every day. And basically, I went from there to um, teaching at Columbia. And that enabled me to put more time into making my own work. So there was a kind of a seven-year hiatus where I did a couple of art projects um, that I won't show you. But Rhizome was really kind of my life. And I, I think it's worth noting that uh, if you are you know, if you think of yourself as an artist or you're thinking of becoming an artist, it's certainly a very precarious future. It's not like going to law school and then, you know, um, getting a job as a summer associate in a law firm and then clerking for a court and then getting a job in a law firm. There's kind of like a ladder you can climb. It's not that way if you're an artist. But in the olden days, like say even in the 1970s or 1980s, you could sort of, there was like this imaginary path that you could aim for, which was, Moving to New York, getting represented by a big gallery, selling lots of work, 
maybe getting a teaching job, a full-time teaching job. And those opportunities are very, very scarce. So I would encourage you to think of yourselves as entrepreneurs, as creating your own opportunities, basically. Um, if the art world doesn't want you, you know, create your own parallel art world. Um, and I've seen lots and lots of artists uh, find you know, original and unexpected ways. Like one graduate of the program that I chair now at SVA, uh, he graduated three years ago. And um, his first job was working for a gallerist who had started an art fair in Miami. And he went down there, and he really didn't like the guy, and he didn't think he ran a very good art fair. And he thought, I could do this. And so now he runs an art fair. He started his own art fair, and that's his day job. It's a company. Every year, you know, galleries from all over the world converge on Miami and show their art in this art fair that he produces. And that's his day job, and he makes art the rest of the time. And that's how he's paying his student loans and paying his rent and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, I mean, I won't go into too much more detail, but you can start a business and be an artist. And sometimes your art is your business. So, um, so this is one of the first projects I made after Rhizome when I, you know, got, had, I did get a teaching job. And that afforded me more time, especially in the summers and winter vacations to make art. This was a commission for a gallery called Computer Fine Art. And it's, the title of the piece is Revelation 2.0. What I did was create a parallel version of the CNN website. Um, if you went to computerfinearts.com slash revelation 2.0, you would see like an, in, an introductory page. And then if you clicked further, what you got was something that looked like this. It, it no longer works. I can no longer demonstrate it. Uh, it became obsolete. And I have, you know, the code is too complicated, really. CNN has changed too much. But um, it was like a parallel version of the CNN website with all of the text and graphics removed. So all that was left were background colors and photographs. It kind of created a minimal version of it. Um, the, the idea, of, you know, very vaguely was sort of that, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words and that uh, it could allow you to sort of see this, the visual structure of the website and also um, look at the images without the, all the contextualizing information of the news discourse. So moving forward now, um, in 2005, I got uh, a job teaching at Brown University. Now, I had done my undergraduate studies at Brown. Um, I arrived at Brown uh, uh, as a freshman in September of 1985. And that was right at the peak of the anti-apartheid movement on college campuses. So as some of you may have heard, South Africa used to have um, a racist apartheid government that had a kind of extreme separation between um, whites and blacks, and it was inc incredibly oppressive. And uh, I just don't want to take for granted that everyone knows what apartheid is. Um, maybe I should take that for granted. But um, in any case, students all over the United States and in Europe were protesting to get their governments and universities to divest from corporations that did business in South Africa as a way of putting pressure uh, on, on the South African um, government and trying to uh, enable a kind of regime change, which inevitably, eventually was successful. In any case, when I arrived at Brown in 1985, the main green was a shanty town. Students had erected a shanty town, and just the campus was just alive with politics. When I got back there in the fall of 2005, 20 years to the month later, as a faculty member, it was three years into the war in Iraq, a very bloody and unpopular war, and the campus was quiet. And I was just puzzled. I was like, what has changed in these 20 years? You know, I mean, the war in Iraq is certainly seems more immediate and, and something that uh, in which we're even more implicated than apartheid was. Um, why is it that my students felt like protest wasn't a good use of their time? And so started a conversation. And I was still really puzzled. But my way of, of kind of working my way into those questions was to do an art project uh, around protests and how it had changed uh, from really the, the new left movements of the Vietnam era, which, which it cast a really long shadow over my generation uh, and the present. Um, this is just an image of some, some brown students protesting. Uh, they were getting arrested, doing a civil disobedience action at the Army recruiting office in downtown Providence. And here's an image of, um, of a RISD student, a grad student, holding up a sign in the background. He's, so the guy wearing the pink shirt is holding the the, the kind of blue and turquoise colored sign that says, hey, hippie, shut up. And then underneath you, it's hard to read, nobody likes the war. 
Um, so he's doing a counter protest against the brown students who are protesting the war. And this just to me really played out the dynamic of there were obviously some kind of committed activist students who were following in the footsteps of their parents. They even named their organization the SDS, Students for Democratic Society, which was the name of the biggest anti-war student organization of the late 1960s. And they're using the same kind of tactics that their parents had used, sitting in at the, at the recruiting office, things like that. And then here's this like somewhat cynical, but also perhaps realistic student saying, you know, you're wasting your time. Nobody's listening. And to some extent, that student was right. Nobody was listening. On the eve of the US-led invasion of Iraq in March of 2003, there were coordinated protests all over the world, in, in New York, in Los Angeles, in London, in Paris, in Rome. The BBC, which is pretty conservative, estimated that 10 million people marched uh, on one day in March of 2003, right before we invaded. But nobody blinked. I mean, it hardly even made it onto the front page of newspapers. It ha had no effect on the conversation about the war. Um, and I just was really puzzled about how so much had changed in the intervening you know, uh, years. So what I decided to do was stage a series of reenactments of protest speeches from the new left movements of the Vietnam era. So the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, um, the, um, the, the movement to unionize uh, Chicano farm workers in California. Uh, it's called the Port Huron Project, named after the Port Huron Statement, which was the manifesto of the Students for a Democratic Society. And what I did was I, I would find these historic speeches, selected speeches that had contemporary resonance and that were staged in public locations where I could stage a reenactment outdoors, like in a park or on a city street, um, and then uh, cast actors to deliver the speeches to an audience that would assemble, videotape it, film it, and then share the video online and show it in galleries. I'll play you a video. My dear friends of peace and freedom, I come to New York today with a strong feeling that my dearly beloved husband was snatched suddenly from our midst. Slightly more than three weeks ago now would have wanted me to be present. You who will not be deluded by the talk of peace, but who press on in the knowledge that the work of peacemaking must continue until the last gun is silent. I come to you in my grief only because you keep alive the work and dreams for which my husband gave his life. We must now turn our attention and the sole force of the movement to the problems of the poor here at home. Oops. Sorry. Gives me a good opportunity to fast forward. This is um, an excerpt from a speech that was originally given by the president of SDS, that student organization that was resuscitated in 2008, but that had its first incarnation in, in 1965. It was given on the National Mall in front of the Washington Monument um, at the first big march on Washington that ended the war in Vietnam before about 20,000 people. And as you listen to the speech, think about how it sounds almost the like The incredible war in Vietnam in has provided the razor, the terrible, sharp cutting edge that has finally severed the last vestige of the illusion that morality and decency are the guiding principles of our <laughs> foreign policy. But perhaps, Perhaps what the president means when he speaks of freedom is the freedom of the American people. But what has this war done for freedom in America? It has led to even more vigorous governmental efforts to control information, to manipulate the press, and to pressure and persuade the public through distorted or downright dishonest documents. The president mocks freedom if he says that this is a war to defend the freedom of the Vietnamese. 
Perhaps the only freedom this war represents is the freedom of the war hawks in the Pentagon and in the State Department to experiment with counterinsurgency and guerrilla warfare in Vietnam. So, you know, when he talks about distorted and downright dishonest documents, it, you can't help but think about, for example, the whole um, fiction of weapons of mass destruction that we use as an excuse to invade Iraq. So, like, you know, one of, the th one of the things that became clear to me as I read these speeches and became familiar with them as I worked with the actors and as I staged these reenactments was that the more things change at some level, the more they change to stay the same, right? The, the problems of you know, militarism and imperialism and economic inequality are ever present, but it's like the solutions, like the, the tactics of resistance are what would need to change. You guys heard of Cesar Chavez? Thank you for inviting me to participate in this meeting. It's been hard for me and the farm workers. We have been so absorbed in our own struggles that we have not participated in an active way in the battle against the war. So we must work every day, week after week, month after month, year after year if necessary, outlasting the opposition, using time to defeat them. That is what it takes to bring change in America today. Nothing less than discipline, organized, non-violent action every day will challenge the power of the corporations and the generals. But people have to decide to do it. Individuals have to decide to give their lives over to the struggle for specific and meaningful social change. And as they do that, others will follow. Their children will follow. The young will follow. And if we offer the young an alternative out of the energies and resources of our own lives, perhaps fewer and fewer of them will seek their manhood in affluence and war. It's up to each one of us. And it won't work unless we use our own lives to show the way. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Davis was a philosophy professor at UC Berkeley. I just like to say that, that I like being called sister much more than professor. Now, there has been a lot of debate in the left sector of the anti-war movement as to what the orientation of that movement ought to be. And I think that there are two main issues at hand. One group of people feels that that movement, the anti-war movement, ought to be a single issue movement. The cessation of the war in Vietnam. They don't want to relate it to any other forms or kinds of oppression taking place in this country. There is another group of people who say that we have to make those connections. We have to talk about what's happening in Vietnam as being a symptom of something that is happening all over the world, as something that is happening here in this country. So I just oh, I did it again. Yikes. It's worth playing just a little bit more. Um, so one thing I want to emphasize in this project is that there were these multiple layers uh, there were the reenactments themselves, which were kind of like car park, you know, um, participatory uh, performative interventions in public space. But then there were all these um, ways of, uh, of capturing the documentation and, and circulating it, distributing it um, in art venues, on YouTube, in Times Square. 
So I'll show you uh, one of the ways that I made it into a, uh, an installation in galleries. Here we go. So this is a reenactment of a speech that Stokely Carmichael, who was a leader of SNCC, the um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, in the late 60s, gave in front of the United Nations in 2000 and in 1990, in 1967. Without a demand, it never has and it never will. See, we have not only the right to speak out, we have an obligation. We must be involved. We must fight racism in all of its manifestations. We must also look truthfully at this land of the free and home of the brave. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loved in freedom come. Yeah, so I'm just gonna um just gonna pause on this for a second. So this this installation is fairly simple. Um, two screens set at angles to each other. Um, each is showing a single channel of video that is uh, shot by one camera with no camera movement and no, no edits, no zooms or pans. Um, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the camera angle and the angle of projection. So it creates this kind of illusion of space. Now in cinema, there's also an illusion of space. Like when you go to the movies, um, the rules of, of mise-en-scene with like, you know, the way, you know, you have like a shot and then a reverse shot produce this illusion of spatial continuity. Um, but what the, the effect of that is this kind of disembodiment, like you're sitting in the audience and you kind of get lost in the movie and you kind of lose touch with your phys sorry, physical body. Um, I just lost touch with my physical body. Um, but uh, so what I was trying to do uh, in the symbolic form of this installation was allow you to basically have an illusion of space while remaining in your body. So in order to zoom, you walk towards the screen. It's also important that they're rear projections, so you can walk right up to the screen without casting a shadow. Um, to pan, you turn your head, and you're, you're, you're at the same scale as the audience, so you feel like you're really um, in, a, in a crowd of observers. It, and it, what, what I was trying to get at in a, I'll admittedly, perhaps too subtle way, was this question of, um, of, of embodied politics, of uh, the, the way we perform our politics with our bodies in public by amassing in the streets. Um, and the effect of mediation on that, right? Like, what, is, what does it mean? How is it different to beat a protest versus to watch a protest on TV, as if there were protests on TV anymore? There aren't, but watch it on YouTube uh, versus like clicking on a petition, you know, on a website or, or like liking uh, uh, a, a protest message on Facebook. You know, what, is, what is the importance of embodiment in an increasingly mediated? Uh, um, public sphere. So the last, the last kind of uh, avatar of this project was a book in which I took the texts of all the speeches and published them along with documentation of the reenactments and also archival photographs of the original speakers, uh, plus a couple of essays. So next project uh, is called the Dystopia Files, and I, I was still interested in um, what you might call the performative politics of protest. How do people perform their politics in public with their bodies? And I started looking at, at, um, at contemporary protest, protest in the post 9-11, post Patriot Act, like uh, era of homeland security. Um, so, you know, there were lots and lots of protests um, throughout the 2000s and the, the police got increasingly sophisticated uh, at, at controlling and containing protest. And um, I learned you know, quite a bit about how this all works. And one of the things that, that caught my attention after a while was just the proliferation of cameras at every protest. The protesters bring their cameras. The artists <laughs> like me bring their cameras. I you know, was taping a lot of protests. Uh, the indie media journalists and the mainstream media journalists bring their cameras. And the police even bring their cameras. So there's cameras everywhere. We're in this kind of synopticon, right? Not a panopticon where you have like, you know, the, the big brother watching the many, but it's like the many watching the many. What's the effect of that on how we 
perform our politics and also how we perceive these performances. So I started to assemble an archive, you know, having this kind of background in archiving, of video clips of interactions and conflicts between police and protesters in the United States between uh, 2002 and 2010, which is when I completed the project. Um, it was footage that I shot and that was shot by other artists. And there's a surprising number of artists out there who, <laughs> who film protests once you start to look. Um, a lot of stuff shot by indie journalists. Um, and I also got my hands on uh, footage shot by police. And um, I did some like Freedom of Information Act um, requests and got stonewalled. And I realized that there was a shortcut, which is to talk to the civil rights attorneys who represented the protesters. Because if you get arrested at a protest and held unlawfully, you might sue the police department. And then the video that the police shot could be, would be um, entered into a, a, as evidence and then revealed through the process of disclosure. And once the case is over, the attorney could share it with me. Um, similarly, if, if um, the police were pressing charges and a protester were you know, um, being defended by like a, a pro bono attorney, that attorney might be able to share the footage with me. So I, had, I ended up with a lot of police footage too, which is really interesting to see how the kind of, the, the technology that the police were using was almost always the same, these cheap consumer video cameras, but the visual rhetoric of the footage was always a little bit different. They weren't professional videographers by any means, but one thing is that the camera angles were different because the camera was behind the police lines, right? So uh, you'll see as I show this next video a little bit how that works. This is an installation at a museum uh, in Massachusetts. I'm projecting excerpts from this archive on this glass door that I frosted to turn it into a rear projection screen. So this video is, is actually appearing in reverse because it's shown from the inside. And so when you see text, it's backwards. It's to emphasize that you're on the outside of the video. So I'm just going to pause it for a second. This video here is shot by the Olympia Washington Police Department. The camera angle is behind the line of the police as they're advancing on these protesters who are sitting in on a road that connects a military installation to the harbor. Uh, the group is called Port Militarization Resistance, and they were trying to prevent um, this road from being, and the harbor from being used to send tanks and Humvees and stuff like that to Iraq. So they're sitting in and they're, they're in the process of getting arrested. Um, so this is just an example of, of police footage. This was at a, like a WTO protest in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I shot this in Harlem at a uh, right, so as you see, when the door is open, the projection turns off and the lights in this little gallery turn on. And so what, what the viewer or visitor is presented with is this empty gallery um, with these locked files. And the files, I, I've, re, I've labeled the files with the names of all these different activist groups in the United States. I just picked the ones with the best names, like the Yes Men, the Temple of Love, Time's Up, Glass Bead Collective. That's actually an artist group that does nothing but shoot video of, uh, of protests and project them on the inside of uh, translucent geodesic domes. That's their practice, Glass Bead Collective. So these, these files are also locked. You can't open them. So it's this very simple interactivity. There are sensors that detect whether the door is open or there are people in the gallery. And if it senses anything, it turns off, turns off the video and keeps the lights on. And then as soon as it senses that the gallery is empty again, the video comes back on and the lights turn off. There's a lot of... Uh, interactive installations involve a lot of randomness and indeterminacy, really complex interactivity. Um, I wanted to make the interactivity so straightforward that it, it became really clear what was happening so that it could be potentially legible, right? So that you could think, what does this mean? 
what does this mean that when I open the door, the video goes away? When I try to, you know, to, to enter the archive, the archive is in a way um, occluded or s perhaps even hidden, censored, held at a distance. This is just a, I'm not going to show video of this, but I did another version of this interactive installation at a gallery in Croatia where um, I, I had three projections. One was footage shot by protesters. Middle was footage shot by artists and journalists. And on the right was footage shot by police. And then when, the, when anybody was in the gallery, the um, protest footage was replaced with green, blue, and red color fields. Just a sort of somewhat different variation of a, a very similar idea. I also um, have done a series of performative screenings of material from this archive. First at this cinema in Paris, and I'll play a clip of this. I made a th half an hour long montage of clips, and then invited, for each performance, I invited guitarists to improvise, to watch the, f the film and improvise and, and play a kind of uh, improvisatory soundtrack. <laughs> you can see because it's so dim but there's a guitar standing in front of the screen and uh, there are these black vertical bands moving slowly across the screen so the part of the image is almost always hidden kind of like in that first installation where you're just seeing this kind of narrow vertical band of this larger picture it also activates you as a viewer you're constantly peering around it trying to fill in the gaps with your imagination So as I, you know, as I worked on this project, I came to see the relationship between police and protesters quite differently. As you can probably tell, you know, my sympathies are generally with the protesters, but, um, but I came to, to see these encounters as a kind of public theater. Um, they're highly ritualized. They almost follow a script. People, the performers show up in their costumes, whether it's a stormtrooper costume or an anarchist costume or a kind of a hippie costume. Um, and they, they perform their roles. You know, they arrest or they get arrested. They beat or they get beaten. Um, and there are, some, there are some scenes in which uh, sort of like post-arrest, people are just standing around and it's almost like they've, they're backstage and they've like sort of dropped their roles and you see police and protesters just kind of talking. Um, so in, in this project, I really, I really came to see the, the performativity of both protest and the policing of protest in much more literal terms, really as a kind of public performance of politics, almost theatrical, almost like a, like a kind of public ritual. So all this video is online if you want to follow up and see them in their entirety. So just a couple of quick screenshots or performance stills of other versions of this, uh, this version of, um, of dystopia files. So this is at the Wexner Center, which is at Ohio State in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. This guitarist was amazing. She was a member of a, a girl band back in the 90s. And any of you ever heard of the girl? It's like this sort of like punk rock, like girl punk rock movement. Um, this is in San Diego. 
So every time I did it, you know, I'd work with a local guitarist and the performance would have a very different flavor. Right, so um, next project. Having looked in, in Port Huron Project and Dystopia Files uh, at, you know, performances of politics uh, on the left, you know, the progressive end of the political spectrum, and then, you know, at the sort of the, the, the policing, you know, the sort of right-wing politics start to, to, to trickle in. In this project, I really wanted to look at how uh, politics is performed on the far right. And so I started looking at the American militia movement. Um, so uh, we've had militias here in America since the 18th century. Um, the American Revolution, you know, was won largely by militias um, before the army kicked in. But, um, but it also has a long history in between. But in the, in the 1980s, uh, um, the far right, um, uh, some neo-Nazis, some kind of uh, uh, separatist uh, Christian fundamentalists and others started to form paramilitary groups to defend themselves against an increasingly militarized police state. Um, it largely arose, um, you know, we think of it as being this thing that happens in like rural Wyoming, uh, Montana, maybe northern Michigan, but in fact it largely arose on the suburban rural frontier, rural areas that were being suburbanized, um, rural areas that were being enclosed by the jurisdictions of, of police forces that were becoming weaponized and militarized. And that would freak right-wing gun owners out because they didn't want, you know, cops with big weapons taking away their guns. Um, uh, in addition to the kind of scary, like, neo-Nazi um, conspiracy freaks, there was also um, more of a kind of libertarian end of that spectrum. Uh, there were militia groups that espoused tolerance that repudiated racism. It's somewhat ideologically diverse within the sort of ecosystem of the right. Um, the, some really good groups have cast the militia movement with a, or painted the militia movement with a rather broad brush. Um, they're not all crazies, as I've discovered, um, but many of them are crazy. Um, and I, I started reaching out to militia groups in the hope of finding one that would allow me to film their training exercises. Um, I was also doing a lot of research online, like watching militia training videos on YouTube. Just like everybody else, they take a camera and <laughs> put it on YouTube. Um, but I, f I finally found this one group in upstate New York uh, in the southern tier, which is this like suburban rural frontier area um, just north of the Pennsylvania border, kind of south of Syracuse and Rochester, where these guys would get together uh, on weekends in camouflage and do paramilitary training. Um, preparing themselves for some kind of potential future breakdown in law and order when they might need to defend themselves against people who, you know, might want to hurt them. Um, so they train. And the leader is an Iraq veteran who did a couple tours in Iraq and learned a lot and had a lot of skills that he could share with his friends out in the woods with, you know, large automatic weapons and real bullets. Um, I went back. So what I, that, that last image was from my first visit. Um, I, should, I should acknowledge that I'm collaborating on this project with Chelsea Knight, who's an artist who lives in Brooklyn, who I met because she had done some really interesting work working with performance and right-wing politics. Went back and um, shot some more footage in the leader's backyard where he's demonstrating different shooting positions and formations. This is his girlfriend, Kenzie. The leader's name is Nick. So then uh, took this footage that Chelsea and I had shot at this training exercise and also in, in the leader's suburban backyard and collaborated with a choreographer and his dance company to develop uh, a language of uh, performances that translated the, the, the military training exercises into the more uh, abstract and, and aestheticized language of dance. We then showed films of the militia training and the dance performances in various video installations different kinds of configurations. And then uh, collaborated with the second choreographer and other dancers in Paris for an exhibition at the Palais de Tokyo uh, a year ago, last summer in June. As the project evolved, the focus shifted from using dance as a way to get at and understand the performative language of right-wing militia training to using militia training as a kind of metaphor for choreography and dance training. 
which is to say for the dancers, what they found interesting was the way that this video emphasized the discipline and the power dynamics of choreography and dance performance. So it was this kind of evolution. This is a montage of all the footage that kind of layers it together and gives you a sense of how it all works. Posse Comitatus was really one of the coolest things about that project for me was just the opportunity to work with choreographers and dancers and that as a, as a medium uh, it's so different from the the way I work which is often so disembodied um, and you know for for dancers it's all about um, you know kind of embodied kinetic performance so uh, so in working on this project, I, um, I became very curious about the site of these militia training exercises, always in the woods. You, watching these videos on YouTube of militia groups all over the country, they always retreat to these, you know, these pastoral landscapes to perform their politics. And at some level, it's obviously for practical reasons. It's hard to shoot automatic weapons, you know, in this kind of environment or in, in the city, but, but also I, I started to feel like it was also, um, there was another significance to it that um, I started to think about some political philosophy that I read in college, uh, John Locke and, and, and Hobbes, who talked about the state of nature. There's this idea of the social contract in liberal political theory that we give up certain freedoms in order to enter into a social contract where we gain um, protections from the government. We're protected from each other and, but there's this imaginary state of nature that precedes the social contract. It's like the, the tabula rasa on which uh, the social contract is written. And I had the sense that one of the reasons why these militia guys retreated to the woods to perform their politics is because it allowed them to rewrite the rules of society, to sort of imagine this, this new world that they would create after the breakdown of law and order. 
you know, either on, you know, sort of fundamentalist Christian grounds or libertarian grounds. So I really started to think about the, the landscape. And here my work just takes a big swerve. Um, this is a, one of these militia training videos I mentioned. It's um, Ron Cole, who is one of the, the founders of the, the American militia movement, um, written some pretty scary texts. Here's a, this is a two side-by-side -side screenshots. It's um, Ron Cole on the left, and on the right is uh, a screenshot from Arma 3, which is a contemporary first-person shooter game. And uh, so you know how YouTube recommends videos? YouTube started recommending all these video game play videos. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. The, you know, the landscapes are the same. And I started thinking about how like, the militia guys were playing video games at night and then going out and running around the woods by day. And were they, like when they're playing video games, were they rehearsing for their training exercises, which are themselves kind of pre-performances, like rehearsals? Or were their militia training exercises maybe reenactments of video game play? There was this kind of blurring going on in all aspects of contemporary life between the virtual and the real. And sort of down the rabbit hole I went, and this is what I came up with, um, a series of landscape photographs that I made in first-person shooter video games. These are pretty large. Um, this one's four, about four by six feet. Um, I found first-person shooter games that have particularly lush, vivid, realistic landscapes. Um, either navigated through these game worlds to sort of evade uh, other, you know, soldiers and, and players and, and take pictures in these pristine environments. Or sometimes you can kind of adjust the settings on the games, kind of not really hack them, but like open up a command line interface and turn off what are known as AIs, artificial intelligences, these sort of fake soldiers that run around. So I eliminated all traces of the military fantasy and just showed these pristine landscapes because I wanted to make works that were kind of in dialogue with the history of landscape representation. Um, thinking in particular about um, the Hudson River School of 19th century American landscape painters. I learned, you know, as I was doing background research for this project, uh, learning about the history of landscape painting, that landscape is never neutral, right? It's not, it's never really just about nature. It tends to be maybe a representation of the pa patron's property or a projection of, uh, like, um, imperial fantasies. Um, the Hudson River School, for example, is a, a great example. Um, it was this wonderful efflorescence of landscape representation right at the time when the ideology of manifest destiny and, we and you know, America's expansion westward, sort of uh, taking over territory from Native Americans was uh, in full force. Picturing the land as, as this um, God-given resource for us to exploit. Or in this case, as a kind of screen on which we might write our fantasies of political reinvention. So this is, a, this is from a, an ex exhibition of this project at a gallery in Brooklyn. This is the kind of the front room of the gallery. So the first thing you see are these fairly large photographs of video game landscapes. But they, they look so realistic that when people first see them, the first question they ask is, oh, where is that? Um, it's hard to tell that they're virtual. Um, but usually, like, there's a press release on a shelf, and people kind of figure it out. And then they go into this back room and see this, which is a high-definition video of the militia training ground, where I shot that stuff in the, in the snow. <coughs> oh, that's embarrassing. So I made a series of landscape videos at this militia training ground. Um, just pointing the camera, camera doesn't move, there's no pans or zooms, no edits, just an hour long static shot right on the border between painting and photography really, trying to make a video that was in dialogue with the photographs. But what was interesting is when people saw this after seeing those video game landscapes, they immediately thought it was from a video game, right? So it, it, I was really sort of trying to to play into this ambiguity between simulation and actuality. 
Um, this was the first in what was going to be a series of cloudscapes. Um, this image is modeled in Houdini, which is software used for computer-based, computer-generated animations for TV commercials and movies. Um, like if you ever see a movie with crazy clouds, it, it's probably made in Houdini. Um, but the interesting thing about Houdini is, as those of you who do computer animation know, render time is a real problem. It can keep your compu computer busy for days. So built into the software is the ability to render out on, for example, Amazon's Elastic Computing Cloud Platform. So this is a cloud that's made in the cloud. It was going to be a series, but it turned out to be really hard to do, and I thought one was enough. Um, <laughs> So this is what I have up at the Corcoran Gallery right now. Um, about a year ago, I was contacted by Philip Brookman, the chief curator of the Corcoran. Um, he had seen the previous work, the video game landscape photographs, Rare Earth, and asked me if I'd be interested in producing a new body of work in response to the Corcoran's collection of American and European landscape painting. And I thought, hell yes. So. Uh, uh, you know, ran through over the you know, next several months a whole bunch of different possibilities and discovered this very new software um, developed by some Eastern European programmers. It's, you can download it for free on the internet. It's in alpha. It's not even in beta. And uh, it's a simulation of the Earth, this software. It takes real terrain data. So as you can imagine, for every coordinate on the planet, for every latitude and longitude, we know roughly the altitude. They used that data to model the entire Earth. And then they wrote very sophisticated fractal algorithms that render trees and snow and grass and bushes and sand and rocks onto this landscape where they ought to be. So what you end up are, with are these images that look kind of like Google Earth or like satellite photographs, which is what Google Earth is, or maybe like drone imagery. They look like you know, uh, aerial landscape photographs taken with machine cameras. You know, aerial landscapes take, shot from robotic planes. But what they are, in fact, are data images. They're completely synthetic. These are aerial photographs of a virtual world taken using software. Um, technically, how I made them was play the software on, a, on a, the gaming PC that I customized for the previous project. But now there are 4K displays that have four times as many pixels as HD. So I was able to make really high resolution screenshots. You could also, like, you can basically fly around in this world anywhere. You can go down, right down to the surface and, you know, stand under the trees or, you know, virtually kick the sand under your feet. But I found this, these aerial images to be the most compelling and the most interesting in light of this kind of golden age of automated aerial photography that we're living in with drones and satellites constantly imaging the surface of the planet. I also was interested in the way this world represents the Earth as if humans didn't exist, as if we hadn't been impacting the surface of the planet for the last couple of millennia. And I found these images so alluring, so attractive, I think partly because I have all this anxiety, as I'm sure many of you do, about what we're doing to the planet, about climate change and you know, uh, mass extinction and stuff like that, global warming. So maybe the appeal of these images is a kind of reaction formation to our fear of, you know, ec uh, ecological catastrophe. So what I, what I do is I take multiple screenshots of, you know, different views of the Earth and then composite them together, merge them together into these collage panoramas, which is what creates the funky shapes. This is quite large. Uh, it's, a, I guess, about eight, little more than eight feet across. Eight feet high and maybe almost nine feet across. They're printed on dye bond, which is a kind of aluminum plastic composite material, commonly used for mounting photographs. But I um, printed them using a UV printer. It's a really new printing technology that allows you to print directly on non-porous surfaces. So instead of printing on paper and mounting it, I was able to print directly on the aluminum which allowed me then to cut the shapes out using a router. And they're just hung on the wall, mounted on these uh, aluminum braces. So they kind of float there without frames, without glass, without any kind of lamination, 
the very immediate experience of the surface. And they, um, so they're in dialogue on the one hand with landscape painting, and the other maybe with the shaped canvases of artists like Ellsworth Kelly and Kenneth Nolan and Frank Stella from the 1960s and 70s. So I think this might be a good time for me to say thank you so much and to invite your questions. And I'll just cycle through the last few images while we talk. Yeah, thank you, Mark. <laughs> if anyone wants to ask questions, please let me know and I will pass the mic around. So I'll jump on it once. <laughs> Is there anybody in the back? No. <laughs> Do you have a question in the back? No, sorry. OK. Um, I guess I will go ahead and ask a question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, feel, I felt like I was going through kind of a, um, a road map through history, I guess, especially the, your earlier work. And I was going to say that I had a little bit of a um, uh, revelation because I had no idea that I was showing your photograph of the car park to my color theory class <laughs> and I've been doing that for three four years now and I had no idea <laughs> yeah so um, just kind of going through and seeing your progression and it seems to me I will take it back to the color theory that it seems like it is pretty simple when you when you think about the what runs through all of your pieces. And I feel like it is the theory of color and how we see things in simple ways, but also tying it to politics. And actually, when I show my presentation to my color theory classes, I show body as politics. So. Huh. Well, I can talk a little bit about how um, we figured out the colors. Because um, I, I remember taking a little bit of color theory in college myself. You know that book by Joseph Albers, right? I'm sure many of you have seen that. There's the color wheel. You learn about complementary color. Totally useless, right? All of it. But what it, you know, what it's about is sensitizing you to color, just getting you to pay attention, to understand that color is relative. You know that you know when you put orange next to blue, something happens. It's different from putting orange next to red. Um, but so this campus had 14 parking lots ranging from really big, there was one that had like 1,200 cars, and to really small, there was one that fit only 14 cars. So for three days, we spent like several hours each day in the parking lots counting cars and writing down their color. And then we realized it's really hard to know what color something is, right? What's the color? I mean, you know, blue, but then like we had all these different blues. There was dark blue, there was light blue, there was metallic blue, all these different yellows, beiges. So what we had to do was sort of figure out what all the different possible color categories were and map those onto the sizes of the lots. So we, we realized that, for example, about 19, about 20% of the cars were red. And there was one lot that had about 20% of the spaces. So that became the red lot. That was easy. Then like, there was this huge lot. And we realized we could make a grayscale. So we parked, parked like the dark cars at one side and the light cars at the other. There was a white lot, of course. There was a green lot. That year. Um, there were a few cars, like Saturns and maybe some Mazdas, that were definitely metallic raspberry. <laughs> and 1.4% of the cars were metallic raspberry, and there was like one lot with 1.4% of the spaces. So that was we actually had a, a metallic raspberry lot. Um, so that's that's my color theory answer. Oh, feedback. Okay. Um, so at the beginning, when you were talking about um, business and art, uh, and I was sort of looking through the presentation, and it's basically a career trajectory, which is amazing. Um, and to see that you were on the pulse, really, of the creation of the internet, which changes the way that we as artists sort of create narratives about ourselves. Um, what do you feel like is the one thing that you sort of elide or like look over when you're trying to create a narrative of your work as it's grown? Do you ever feel like you've cheated like one particular aspect of how the work came across in describing it. I don't know. I feel that sometimes, like when I'm creating like a narrative of like 
you know, yeah. how my work came to be that, like, there's some things that, like, oh, I didn't really emphasize that, or there wasn't room to, and I was just wondering if that's something that yeah, you as well, an artist Okay, so this, this brings me to why my talk has the title, Art is a Three-Letter Word. Um, so sometimes when you're invited to give a lecture as an artist, it'll be at, like, an art school, and they just say, talk by Mark Drive. Other places, they really want a title, because maybe like in this context all the other lectures have titles maybe because they feel like people want to know more about what you're going to talk about but I don't like giving my talks titles anymore because in fact I don't think they're I don't want to impose a synthetic common denominator on this work I, I didn't really there were some themes like performance of politics like the idea of art as being something that can be for destroyed but any theme I could identify I could find you two or three works that I showed you that don't apply Right, so I don't know. I I think it's there's a fairly organic trajectory. Certain themes arise in a, different projects, but there's nothing that really covers it all. And in this context, I find it helpful to be just more honest about the fact that you know I, I've given lectures called performance mediation in the public sphere, and I talk about the notion of the public sphere and Jurgen Habermas and rearticulations of the public sphere and performance theory, and you know it's what academia demands. Right, exactly. But I'm, I'm choosing to resist that a little bit at this point. <laughs> As it's been a long day, so I'm hoping this question will come out as lucid. Um, I'm going to take you back to sort of the pre-swerve part of your talk concerning protest politics. And um, I'm aware of this might seem like a little bit of an unfair question, because I'm asking about what you haven't done. OK. Uh, but on the one hand, this is point of my career. On the one hand, you seem to valorize certain aspects of protest politics in a certain era. So you did these reenactments of things that had taken place in the classic days of, you know, SNCC, SDS, and so forth. So that's late 60s, early 70s. And your question you posed was why were the protests around university students uh, as successful? Or why was there this repetition of history that was having even less effect? On the other hand, you seem to have done a certain amount of work which is about sort of containing protest politics, where you've done works on you know, how it's become performance, how it's become ritualized. And I'm wondering whether in your own mind you are running a risk maybe of sort of cynically ghettoizing, not meaningful, I suppose I don't want to impute cynicism to you, but ghettoizing protest politics by making all politics look as if all that's been reduced to now is performance. And therefore, we it's all trivial. Whereas, of course, someone who's as astute as you are in matters of political in the US will know that, of course, there's this underlying sort of day to day organizing which was greatly diminished since the 60s and 70s. I mean, the, the death of the labor unions, the deliberate targeting of certain sections to the left by the counterintelligence program of the FBI's and so forth. So, uh, that's sort of one question. You, do you ever, does it ever occur to you that perhaps you're running the risk of disempowering? Yes. Rather than valorizing and, yeah, and empowering. And then the, the final part of the question is this, and, and that is, early on, you mentioned that you, 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 know, you give this exhortation to the, the students, anybody present, why don't you become artistic entrepreneurs? The sort of social entrepreneur thing one hears a lot about in art schools these days, which is fine, but it can be taken as a very individualistic thing. Okay. So do you, when you emphasize entrepreneurship, do you also emphasize the importance of doing things collectively? Okay. A form of organizing. I'll look at Fantastic, that. challenging questions. Yeah. Um, I'll take the last one first. Okay. You're right. You know, um, I, I sometimes when I when I talk about um, maybe we could call it the entrepreneurial imperative mm -hmm. for contemporary artists, I fail to contextualize it within the larger narrative of neoliberalism and uh, you know, deregulation, for example, the erosion of the social safety net. Um, the erosion of collective um, organizing, and the rise in, in economic precarity that results, mm -hmm. right? So I kind of glossed it when I was talking about how you can't count on universities and galleries taking care of you anymore, mm -hmm. but it's a response to a really bad you know, situation in the political economy. Could the Port Huron Project and Dystopia Files be seen as disempowering or cynical? Definitely, mm -hmm. um, and I've been, you know, been taken to task for that. Uh, at the reenactments, I didn't organize the audience, for example, to 
go out and do things to affect change. It was really more, I, I see those projects as not political art, but as art about politics. Um, to me, political art is art, one way of defining it is art that actually does politics, right? Art that attempts to affect change. And what I was doing, I think, was more trying to understand it. Um, I think that I have come to some tentative answers about why protest had become so ineffectual or was perceived to be so ineffectual between 1968 and 2008. I think it largely has to do with tactics of resistance not evolving to keep pace with tactics of policing and suppression of, of protest, right? So basically the state got much better um, in media. Like, you know, there were cameras in the battlefields in Vietnam, not in Iraq, right? Um, also, just like the media landscape changed a lot. Everybody complained, I think, in the, you know, before YouTube that there were too few channels and they were controlled by corporations. And now everybody can have a channel, but the audience is com incredibly dispersed. So it, in fact, gets harder to mobilize people. Um, all that changed, though, in 2010 with the Arab Spring and Occupy, where suddenly there was this convergence of new tactics for on the ground uh, protest, the occupation, with quicktivism or online organizing and social media, and there was this incredibly synergistic effect. You know, you could say that Occupy was a, was, was a failure because it actually didn't create any long, or created very few long-term organizations. You know, those old models of organizing are, are much more difficult to, to carry out successfully, but it changed the debate. It brought the issue of economic inequality right into the political conversation in this country and globally in a way that I think was very impactful. Arab Spring, you know, we can, bemoan you know, the, the aftermath of these uprisings and revolutions in Egypt and elsewhere, the kind of reactionary shutdown. Um, but they really opened a window of possibility uh, for popular resistance. So what I was really looking at, I think, was a moment of a, kind of like a low point. <laughs> but it was like right before, it was like the, it's darkest before the dawn, right? Um, so I think things look really different now in 2014 than they did in 2008 or 2010. My question has a lot more to do with like, the social justice aspects of this. Um, how, in your opinion, do you think issues that are here today, like what's happening in Ferguson, Missouri, will be represented later in, in media, in art, in all aspects like that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, how will they be represented later? I wish I had a good answer for that. I don't know. Just like in, in your opinion, based on like what you've done with past social issues that are still relevant, do you think that social issues that are here today will be represented in similar ways? Do you think they'll be represented differently? Do you have any ideas on that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, wait, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear them and maybe I could respond to that. I just, I, I don't, I'm clueless. I guess I'm, I'm more asking like if you think they will continue to be relevant like the issues that you've been talking about happening? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. Uh, I would hope so. Uh, it's, you know, I've always found prediction to be, I just can't, I don't see the future very clearly. So I'm actually coming at this from a fairly different perspective. I'm actually in the information systems department. Um, I do HCI, human computer interaction. And you talked a lot about um, sort of art on the early internet, which is kind of way back for me, but I actually do remember, <laughs> at least in 96, I was an early adopter. And, and so the thing is, is that early human computer action, I actually really liked the one you did where you stripped off the text and showed the underlying layout of CNN's terrible website um, back in the day. But, but early, the early internet was so limiting. I mean, if you think about what you can do with a blank piece of paper, it's enormous. But what you can do with a blank website is actually much, much more limited. But in a lot of ways, it was also democratizing. You could make your terrible MySpace page where instead of your white gallery walls, you had your horrible tiled background of your favorite character for scrolling endlessly, right? And, and that was not just possible, but socially acceptable despite the limited format. But now we've come to a place where it's much more designed. So do you have any thoughts about how 
while we've expanded what we can do technically, whether or not we've actually limited what we allow people to do with their own digital space in an already limited uh, digital environment. Mm. Yeah, like the, well, well, so like if you think about this shift from MySpace to Facebook, where with MySpace you had, you know, this very, very flexible palette, Facebook, you make very few design decisions. Instagram is maybe, you know, even a, a further push in that direction, um, where it reduces it to basically an image and a caption. Um, but then, you know, I mean, still anybody can make a website with the will, you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, even with something like Tumblr, you know, if you know a little CSS, you can customize the heck out of it. Um, I don't know if I really bemoan the, the constraints. Uh, but I also, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of, to be honest, like strong opinions or even very informed opinions about the state of the web these days. Yeah. I mean, um, I definitely think that Facebook's increased the scope uh, upon which you can impact other uh, sources of media. Uh, my friend Diana O right now is doing a series of protests it's called My Laundry Play. Um, and she's gotten on Upworthy, she's gotten on, you know, all of the main Slack of the sites, frankly, but she's done some actual groundwork with it. And all of that generated immediately through Facebook. Um, and that's a, a reach I don't think you could get with a blank piece of paper. So um, I, I think it's easier to bemoan technology than it is to see how it's actually changed the conversation. I think that we do have better conversations now and we also archive them better, so we, we can tell quite clearly that we do have better conversations. Uh, you've mentioned, oh, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, you've mentioned briefly the social impact of your sort of art and experiments and how they give new perspective by allowing people to interact and engage with them. And I was wondering if you sort of uncataloged or, you know, what does that say about people in general, how they're interacting with your experiment? Because like even we've saw seen during, you know, the car video the car video where we've seen car park that art, how some people have decided, you know, no, I'm not gonna do this. And some people have decided, you know, fine, I'll go with it. Or um, I just want to know what you think that says about people in our society. <laughs> you guys are asking all these questions I can't really answer. I'm not a social scientist, one thing. But I, no idea. I mean, first of all, it's a hugely broad question, right? Like, you know, we can parse it down. What does it mean that one person decided, you know, to park a red car in the white lot, or is it a white car in the red lot? Um, you know, maybe she was resisting the, the tyranny of our little art project. Um, but that's not really how I approach it. I'm not really making art in order to um, answer questions. I'm making art more to create experiences that encourage people to ask questions. I think we're yeah. going to have this for the last question, and then we'll have a nice reception afterwards. Okay. Um, uh, I'm so asking is because in kind of your style, like when I look at on like um, what on the project you have is like really have a like a military style like really like little bit geometric and little bit like serious. Even though like you have like on the protesting about like you know what's going on in the U.S. and other country, and even though about the landscape, this thing have I I can feel like little bit have like a strong serious moment and kind of discretion. So is that that, so on the style you have in on this project, is that like from the feeling toward like the people uh, in the US and other country to the world? Or is that because of feeling um, you want to share with people like what, what kind of message you, you go to, in, you know, you put in the art. So like represent something about how people look at in your viewpoint or, you know, you so you're, you're saying that my work is is serious and has a kind of like a highly disciplined, 
quality to it that you see it across all the projects? Yeah. And like more about like, you know, military, uh, mm -hmm. politics, science, and going on. But in the, dips, in, the, in the side, you know, you still like uh, describe to show the, the performance, humanity, uh, to people body action, and you know, the uh, expression to the face, or uh, to the landscape. But I'm just wondering, uh, what, what kind of message you want, you know, people, when people see your art, do yeah. they understand what's going on? Even though that this one I went to the DC, and if I look far away, I cannot, I, I'm thinking about it's a landscape. But when I look very closely, like I really see like, you know, geometric, like small sign, mm -hmm. and it breaks down, you know, all my visual to this landscape. I don't see landscape anymore. I just see like so many like, you know, tiny geometric with like, um, free discretion to me when I saw it. So I just don't know what kind of message you want to like, people like us, like students see. Yeah. I. I guess I would just reiterate that I don't see myself as somebody who's trying to communicate a message through my art. I'm not, I don't have a message I'm trying, I don't have a, um, it, the last time I gave a talk actually, um, the last question was, so I like your art and all, but what are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> I've just been talking for like an hour. <laughs> but I guess the truth is I'm not, there isn't something I'm trying to say. I'm making things that hopefully produce experiences for you that would lead you to see and think about things in a somewhat new way and perhaps ask questions about <coughs> things you hadn't noticed before or um, things you might take as normal to open up new possibilities for seeing and thinking. So it's, it's not like writing a paper. You know, it's, I'm not like trying, I don't have this message that I'm trying to communicate to you. Okay, on that note, please, <laughs>